So just wanted to say thanks to everyone so much for taking time to join us today. We're really excited to have you. And um, some of you have been on our previous Platform Co-op Community Hangout calls, and we've been kind of just inviting different people who are working on different issues um, in the ecosystem and different Platform Co-op projects. And we're really excited today to have the IDRC team talk about inclusive design and how their work connects with Platform Co-ops and what we've been working on together. Um, so we're really excited to, to talk about that. And as I mentioned in the email and on Twitter, please um, gather your questions and comments and we'll have a nice uh, time for Q&A at the end of the call. But I just wanted to give a quick um, uh, run through of what we're gonna do today. So I will kind of give a few instructions and then I'll hand it off to Trevor, who will give a uh, overview of the kind of work we're doing on the kit, some updates on platform co-ops and what we've been working on in the past few weeks. And then we will hand it off to uh, Colin and Yuta who will talk for a little bit about their work at the Inclusive Design Research Center in Toronto, um, inclusive design and what they're working on. Um, and then really that maybe could last for about 15 minutes or 10 minutes or so. And then really we wanna open it up for questions and comments and discussion. So if there are issues that come up that you're thinking about um, in the comments that Yuta and Colin give, uh, write that down and please make a note of it and then we can kind of uh, address your questions as a group and and really have a nice conversation. So um, that's kind of it. We're aiming for maybe like 30 minutes, 45 minutes, an hour, depending on how long the conversation goes. So it's really up to up to everyone here to see uh, what we want to talk about and how long we're going to go for. Um, and then just three quick notes for everybody. Um, if you could keep your microphone on mute just so that when the speaker is talking, there's no background noise. It's kind of a good practice to have so we can all hear each other clearly and understand each other. Um, and then if, if people wanted to actually introduce themselves, I think one good way we found to do that is to write a little blurb about yourself in the chat feature where you can kind of put links to your social media accounts or LinkedIn or Twitter, whatever it is you want to share, maybe talk about what you're working on, what you're interested in. Um, yeah, feel free to use the chat feature for that and write a little blurb so that other people can see who, who is on the call and what you're working on and if they want to connect. Um, and then also I think Zoom allows you to privately chat people too. So if you see someone that you really wanna um, connect with, feel free to do that via the chat feature as well. Um, and then finally, we're recording these calls. So if you don't wanna have your video on, that's totally fine, but I just wanted to let everyone know that we do record these and that we do put them on our website afterwards. So people who couldn't make it at this time can, can take a look at the video and uh, see what we talked about and, and get information on the conversations as well. So um, I think those are all my comments. We have a couple more community hangouts coming up in April. On April 2nd, we're talking with two uh, PhD students who are working on platform co-ops, really cool projects, one in France, one in Germany. Um, that's on April 2nd. And then on April 23rd, we're actually talking with Namya Mahajan, who's the director of a large federation of cooperatives in India. And she'll be talking about the platform co-op um, project that we're working on there. So just keep a note on your calendar for those. Um, but yeah, I think that's it. And I think I'll, I'll hand it over to Trevor who will talk about the platform called Development Kit, where we are with that, and also introduce uh, Colin and Yuta and talk a little bit about um, their work. Yeah, so maybe we just jump in uh, and uh, right in and introduce uh, Colin and Yuta. It's really wonderful to have you both here and uh, really nice to see you. Uh, so let me start with uh, Colin. Uh, he is um, not only a design researcher at uh, OCAD University's Inclusive Design Research Center, but he's also uh, an artist and a composer. And um, so he's a video artist in particular, and he's a co-founder of the Fluid Project, which is an open community dedicated to growing new inclusive co-design tools and practices. And uh, Colin has worked uh, as a designer and technologist in this field of inclusive design uh, for over 20 years. So very impressive uh, people we have here today. And he is also, I should say, the software lead on uh, our um, platform co-op development kit. And uh, Jutta Treviranus, not that she needs an introduction, um, is uh, the director and founder of the uh, IDRC in Toronto, which is, so it's, it's the Inclusive Research Design Center at OCAD University in Toronto. And so she's a 
She has established the IDRC as a really internationally known center with expertise uh, in inclusive design of emerging digital systems, networks, and practices. And she, I mean, her influence uh, worldwide uh, cannot be overestimated uh, in the areas of uh, design, but also policy and um, as an advisor to many foundations and uh, so really fantastic to have both of you here. Very uh, accomplished and incredibly uh, interesting uh, people. So as a start, I should also start uh, uh, by saying that I just came from Sweden and uh, which was extremely uh, energizing to see because uh, there, the Platform Co-op movement is starting there as well. So this was the first uh, Platform Co-op event in Sweden uh, with a lot of energy, with around uh, 12 Platform Co-ops that uh, are currently working in Sweden and uh, with the clear intention to start another sister organization of the PCC uh, in Sweden as well. So that's the news of the day. Okay, so I hand it over to our fantastic guests. Amazing. Thank, thank you, Trevor. Um, so I, I think you and I agreed that, that I would start out, but um, I think we're going to change things up a little bit. So first of all, I'm, I'm so grateful, Trevor and Michael, um, for you offering us the opportunity to talk about inclusive design and more about our work as, as co-designers. And I know, Yuta, you've been busy traveling the world and uh, doing all your presentations. Um, so we agreed that I'd try to start off this conversation and provide some framing for our work and ideas. But I have a confession to make. As I was um, gathering my thoughts for today, last night, I found myself getting stuck. I, I was totally at a loss for what to say and how to say it to you all. Um, for me, a significant responsibility of inclusive design is to take the time to question the taken for granted representations the quotidian and often invisible relations that form the status quo in, of an environment, a technology, a system, or a practice, and to work to recalibrate and redesign those things collectively and in, in more equitable ways. Inclusive design aims to make spaces for different stories to be told, diverse stories, the ones that we don't always hear and told by those who live the stories, do the work, and have the experience to tell them best. So as, as Chimamanda Ngozi Adichie says, a single story creates stereotypes. And the problem with stereotypes is not that they are untrue, but that they are incomplete. They make one story become the only story. So in trying to make a complete story, I thought instead of presenting my ideas about inclusive design, I, I wanted to invite my teammates um, on, on this, this endeavor. Um, and you as well, um, all of whom are thoughtful and creative designers and technology in your own right to help have this conversation about inclusive design and co-design and our work on the Platform Cooperative Development Kit project together. Um, so in particular, I want to broaden the panel of people beyond me and Yuta who will um, lead this conversation and introduce you to Dana Ayat. Cheryl Lee and Michelle D'Souza, all of whom work at the Inclusive Design Research Center and work with Trevor and Michael on the Platform Cooperative Development Kit project um, and solicit their thoughts as well. And of course, we'd very much like you also to be part of the, the conversation, all of you in the session today, either with your own questions or, or thoughts and perspectives that, that come up as we go. Um, so I'm, I'm really just here to, to start the process off. Um, and I wondered, Yuta, maybe if you could, you could start by sharing some perspectives on inclusive design in your experience, um, maybe how it's different from other kinds of design or what sorts of per, uh, perspective shifts go with, with inclusive design. Sure. <laughs> Thanks, Colin. <laughs> and then, of course, um, whatever I say should, have, as Colin says, be uh, contested and uh, possibly stretched and shouldn't be seen. One of the things we say with an inclusive design is, um, and you'll note this on our website as well, is that what we're trying to provide are supportive uh, frameworks as opposed to containers or um, fixed structures. So how is inclusive design different from other design? And uh, 
one of the simple ways in which I frequently um, present this is most design and, and most entrepreneurship, most businesses um, sort of follow the Pareto rule where uh, the 80-20 the rule, you're supposed to design, you're supposed to spend 20% of your energy um, and that will get you 80% of your customers or create a design that works well for, or generally well for 80% of the people and forget the difficult 20%. But one of the things that um, we've discovered over the more than a quarter of a century that we've been um, working in inclusive design is that that's not only fairly destructive for the individuals that are included in those 20%, but it also doesn't work very well for any of our designs because what happens is the designs tend to be not as flexible. Um, they can't anticipate the unexpected as context change. Um, things don't happen. Um, the design doesn't survive and it starts to cost more and more. And so what we've discovered is that in fact, when you begin with those difficult 20%, you create a far better design um, that encompasses a much larger range. So you're, you're compelled to create a system that stretches to encompass many of the things, the changes that might occur to your goal, to your context, to the people that are members of um, your organization, service, etc. So it differs in that we reverse, we basically turn upside down um, the, the usual principles of who you design for, how you design. And um, often we're confused with uh, universal design or, and in fact, we, we sort of overlap with universal design and accessibility if you were to create a Venn diagram of, of the spaces for the various other designs that are about design justice or designing for all, um, we are uh, frequently seen as similar. But I think to some extent, we are somewhat different from those as well. Um, I, since I started the Inclusive Design Research Center, people have frequently asked, um, universal design has seven principles. What are the seven principles of inclusive design? Give us a list of criteria, et cetera. And finally, I broke down and decided, I mean, despite my dislike of listicles, I um, broke down and created something called the three dimensions of inclusive design. And they're basically a, um, or the first dimension is, um, that we need to recognize that everybody is unique and we need to create a design that doesn't uh, cause people to have to compromise. And whatever uh, knowledge we gain in that design process needs to belong to the person that the knowledge is about. Uh, and we need to create the design in, a, in an integrated way. So that's the first dimension. So it's, it's about the person, about the diversity of the, the people that are going to use the designs. The second is that we need to create a process of design that allows people to participate in that. Um, so we practice co-design and Colin will probably talk more as will the others about the process of co-design, but it, but it is, um, the nothing about us without us or nothing for us without us, um, all of those things um, enabling people to participate, who's at the table, who's missing, how do we redesign the table in such a way that people can be there to take part in the decisions, understand the decisions, understand the implications of the decisions. And the third is just recognizing that we're um, functioning within a complex adaptive system. So no design decision is made in isolation, all have ripple effects and um, we try to, as inclusive designers, create virtuous cycles and counteract vicious cycles wherever we can. So we use a systems thinking perspective as well, which is hugely appropriate for platform co-ops. So I'll turn it back over to Colin. Great, thank you. Um, so, so you mentioned co-design and, and I guess I mean, I have thoughts on co-design, but maybe better to have questions about co-design um, and for our, our broader panel. So if we think about co-design as being designing with rather than for, 
um, you know, this, this changes the, the power dynamics, the relationships on a design team between um, what might be conventionally the people in charge of the creative process and those who are often relegated to the, to the role of user. So Dana or Cheryl or Michelle, do you, do you have thoughts on what kinds of practices, um, what kinds of things you do kind of on a day-to-day -day basis to make, um, to, to level the playing field of design and to, to, to do co-design? Thanks, Colin. Yeah, I was just thinking, um, oh, I don't know if it's so much, well, somewhat day to day, but I was thinking about this um, process that we've been starting to call embedded co-design um, because you to when you were speaking about the 80-20 rule and you said, you know, if you're designing for the 80%, it, it doesn't anticipate the unexpected and context can change. It made me think about our experience, um, actually, when we went to SEVA, um, the Self-Employed Women's Association in um, Gujarat, India, because even in the, even in the, our approach to the co-design, we have to be, we have to anticipate unexpected and be flexible, you know, because in that, in that experience, um, you know, we, we went in with a plan, um, and we talked to, we spoke, you know, with Namia a few times beforehand and, and discussed, you know, whether that plan would, would work or not. And, um, but even then we had, we, it changed um, because just based on who the participants were, the, the context, where we were, the fact that we had, you know, language translation happening and, and the fact that um, out of the group emerged some um, facilitation, which is fabulous because really that's what, um, when we talk about, this idea of embedded co-design, it really is about finding the leadership in the community itself. So we hadn't really exactly planned that as an embedded co-design session, but that's sort of um, the form that it ended up taking. And so with the other partners on this project, we're also um, planning to, to take that approach even more so where we're making suggestions for structure and activities in the communities themselves to co-design the tools and the things that we're creating as part of this platform development kit. So um, yeah, I, hope, I don't know if I, I might have missed a few details there, but I hope that that makes sense. Yeah, that's amazing. Um, and I was thinking about in terms of the, the, the role of embedded co-design, um, working with communities that you're not a part of. So um, when we started working on our, our city's co-design um, efforts, where we were looking at how uh, smart technologies and embedded sensors and other things might communities in terms of privacy and surveillance and other things, um, we started to reach out to communities um, often activist communities or neighborhood communities that had their own structures and leadership and other things. Um, so, so, you know, what, what's the role in terms of um, having, having leaders in a community both um, help drive the co-design process and also to get um, the voices that might defer to, um, to the existing leadership patterns? What are the kinds of techniques that you've looked at for that? Sorry, this is somebody, I, Colin, I missed, my internet is, is a little bit coming and going, so I've turned my video off. And so I think what you're asking is how do we find those participants? Yeah, how do you find them in the, in the leaders within the communities and then how do you balance their, their influence versus the, the voices that might otherwise get lost in the process? I know for me, sorry, I'll, I'll just, um, I'll speak briefly again and then I hope someone, someone others have something to say too. I just, I know that um, one, one thing we learned in that process uh, working with SEVO was that um, um, kind of that it that it what I think is a really good approach and I know um, I believe this is some of what we did on the city's project which I, um, I see Sepa Dave's here too she, she was uh, very much leading that that process um, but that getting the more people you can get on board early on even in the planning of the co-design session the better so that it isn't just one person you know, who's representing the group saying, oh, we should do it this way or that way, you know, so the more you can, the, I guess the sooner you can actually start co-designing the whole process, the better. And if you can 
bring in the folks who actually are benefiting from whatever the thing is you're making or doing, um, the sooner, the better. Uh, yeah. And if others want to say something. Yeah, I, I can, I, I'd love to respond to that as well. I, I think w one of the, um, and I'd love to get into sort of discussions of some of the difficult topics that come up, but one of the, the, first things that I frequently do is just prepare people that we're going to be talking about difficult subjects. We're all going to offend. We're all going to be offended. It's how we move uh, um, away from that or how we react or respond to or, or process that um, those disagreements. And so the uh, w one of the, the things that I frequently do is to prepare people for dissonance. There are going to be disagreements and we welcome those disagreements and we want to talk through those disagreements. So a large part of co-design is making it, um, or making it both safe, but also welcome to disagree and then providing some guidance to people regarding how we're going to get beyond those disagreements or how we're going to come to some maybe consensus, possibly not consensus, but how will we deal with the fact that every community is diverse and every community is going to have some disagreements within the community. And uh, it, it does, it takes a lot of thinking on your feet and it's, it's not something that you can do formulaically, um, but um, a large part of it is just preparing everybody for that. And then also con constantly monitoring who are we not hearing from? Who are the people that are missing whose perspectives are not contributed here, but that may be impacted by whatever decisions are being made. So that's a continuous iterative um, process as well that we do within any co-design session. That's great. Any, um, any comments or thoughts or questions so far from the panel or anyone? Well, if to make it a bit uh, uh, concrete for our project, right, I wonder, maybe you can uh, talk a little bit about the, I mean, what we have uh, tried to achieve uh, with, with this platform co-op community, right, how we try to involve uh, as many people as possible and sort of have this heard, but also the difficulty of that, given how dispersed it is, right? So, I mean, it's one thing to go to a particular core, but it's much more difficult to uh, sort of go through that process with a community that is distributed. Maybe your thoughts on that would be interesting. Yeah, I, I think um, one of the things that we try to do within an inclusive design is to have as many options as possible, as many choices as possible. So um, the various opportunities to engage um, and the engagement um, or the, the uh, mechanisms that we provide for engagement use, need to be both um, informing people about decisions or imminent decisions or how they can can weigh in on particular decisions then afterwards why those decisions were made what are the opportunities for feedback and changing those decisions but then also how can you contribute and a whole range of contribute ways to contribute with respect to the timing the the mechanism the the types of things that are welcome um, involved involving um, lots of ways of getting involved because some people like to do it anonymously or like to do it uh, without credit or kudos given to them. Some like to um, be rewarded in, in some sort of way. So, uh, but that, that's only one aspect of it. There's, there's many, many other ways in which we try to provide as many choices as possible to match the diversity of, of community members or potential community, me community members that are out there. But I, I'd love to hear from others as well. This is Michelle, and I completely agree with what you just said. Like this, uh, having this um, really open spaces, so being able to have people participate in different ways and on different things um, all the way through a project, 
And then also from a really practical sense, I, I tend to be a person who goes towards the practical as well, Trevor. Um, we build out little slices of things. And some of these might just be experiments or proof of concepts or things that people can look at tangibly and see like, oh, that isn't at all what I meant, or that's exactly what I wanted, except can you do this? And so it gives people a broader way of being able to participate. And it also starts to make this incremental approach to like having something that we can then use. And, you know, as we try to build something that's going to be inclusive, it, it is going to take longer than if we just built something for one person, like, or one tiny community. But if we build it out incrementally, we find that we have this robust and flexible system. And that's another thing, like, from a technical perspective, we are considering that this is, this is our goal. So we're building into the technologies every day that we're writing code, um, ways of making it flexible uh, throughout its life cycle. And, and another part of, of this incrementalism, I think, is, is, is openness and the ability to see into a process, even if you're, um, you know, like, 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 so to get back to you just point about different ways of participating, pe people have different, like, time commitments that they can bring, maybe Maybe they just have a few minutes to share some thoughts on a survey and something a bit more passive like that is more appropriate. In other cases, like this is a system they're going to live in and use every day. So they want to be part of the process all along. So as, as designers and, and developers of, of new tools and platforms, um, we have a, a kind of responsibility to, if we're working in this iterative and incremental way, to also make that visible and there, there's you know the connection with open source practice and open access as well so things like um open studio where you can you can um uh, talk to designers and, and see what they're working on crits that anyone can attend and share feedback posting designs um openly on on wikis or or websites or other places where people can see the the little steps forward and maybe most of the time you know, everything's great. And then once in a while they have a great idea or a, a suggestion by being able to see the process of, of, of designing, um, they're able to to share that feedback on their time frame and then their, their time skills. And I, I think the other thing that we try to do is to make it safe and model that we're not afraid of failure. We're not afraid, afraid of imperfections or incomplete showing our incomplete work um, because that uh, gives people confidence to make suggestions etc um, and also to um, not just highlight our successes per se but also highlight our where things didn't quite go right or things were not as we expected or intended etc so that people because we find that learning th from those imperfections and and mistakes and things, uh, presumptions that we made that were in fact not founded um, helps as well. It, it gives other people, it invites people in to uh, contribute even though they may not have the confidence to contribute. Yeah, and as a designer who came into inclusive design from a fairly uh, much more formal uh, kind of background in um, actually engineering design, I, I can say that it's a challenge at first to get used to working that way in, in the open, but it's incredibly beneficial, not just, I mean, to me, even as a designer, um, getting used to that way of working, um, it's actually, I really like it a lot better, but I, I definitely can say, I understand the, the challenge of um, getting used to that way of, of working, but um, I highly recommend it. <laughs> I think as a designer as well, I, when I find I find myself to be most creative when I have that feedback, right? When when things are out in the open and people are able to give feedback that you would have never even thought of. So I think it's just um, complementary to the creative process, and in fact, makes it even better and makes makes your thinking even more informed in so many ways. So so definitely find the benefits of working in the open. One of the um, sort of images that we frequently use when we're, we're talking about the, the theory and the practice of inclusive design is uh, a normal distribution, a scatter plot, a jagged starburst of needs and characteristics of individuals. And so what we're trying to do is we're trying to get a 360, <laughs> iterate towards a 360 degree view of 
uh, whatever design we have. And there's absolutely no way, no, no matter how skilled or experienced the team is, that we can do that on our own. And so this is part of the, the reason to continuously invite people in. Um, and it does create a much more robust design that has greater longevity and greater flexibility. It survives uh, far better. Um, so the, the uh, and of course, the only way to do it is, is to continue to ask, who are we missing? What are some of the perspectives that aren't here? Who was impacted by the design that can contribute some thoughts or some critique? And be very, very open to as much critical feedback as possible. Yeah, 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 in that spirit, actually. So I have a question that I want to pose to all of us, right? We're always asking um, who's not at the table. And I would like to open it up to everyone on this call, not just the panelists, of who do you all think, you know, you're all a part of the platform co-op movement in some way. Who is missing from our table? And who should we uh, make more of an effort to fully include in our process? And maybe I'll just add to just uh, in the silence there. <laughs> but, um, uh, we so one thing we have done on this project specifically, and some of you know this because you actually provided feedback to us. But we did we had sent out a survey um, when we were first starting to think about redesigning the platform co um, consortium cooperative consortium website, um, and asked for your feedback about the existing site. What do you like now? What don't you? What do you want to see change? But I even in that I know that that was a that 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 email went out to kind of still a fairly specific community um, that, you know, so there's one concrete example of how could we broaden that scope, you know, who else could we be asking those questions of and how do we get to them and um, yeah. And it's interesting when you're, when you're, and this relates to one of your interests, Yuta, but when you're gathering data as well, when you're trying to make decisions about a, an approach to take a, a design direction or a feature set or other things, if if your data is reflective of um, a lack of diversity, then it's easy to make design uh, design decisions that um, you know have really high costs later. So the question is, you know, what what role also does data um, and metrics, and how do you measure yourself when you're constantly trying to ask that question? Who's not here? How do I include them in the in the measurements and in the decision making process? Yeah, actually, I'm currently at this place in the UK called Digital Catapult, where we're going to be talking about the driven and the impact of data-driven decision making on people that are outlier small minorities and people that are excluded, whether it's um, uh, people who live in poverty or uh, individuals, I mean, anyone can not be served by something that's designed for the typical or average. And many of the issues that platform co-ops hope to address are those issues that individuals who are not um, served, uh, well served by the design for the typical or the average are facing. Uh, so the, the, the one thing that, uh, the one realization, well, I've, I've always realized this, but it sort of came to an alarming um, uh, sort of uh, pitch or pivot point for me was uh, just how much, how we treat data um, is being amplified and automated by uh, th systems such as artificial intelligence and big data, data-driven decisions. Um, and th there's implications for all of the areas that platform co-ops hope to address. What's happening is we are ignoring um, or eliminating those outliers or small minorities. And so um, th that has implications for how um, they or individuals that are not part of that majority or not part of that average are being treated with respect to everything from insurance to um, uh, loans, credit, but also whether an auto automated vehicle will choose to run you over or not, or 
a whole range of, of different things. And so one of the things we frequently do, especially when we're funded by funders or investors who want a specific impact measures, is that we push back against the metrics that are used or the measures that are being used because um, the they generally are talking about a homogenous impact, meaning there's an assumption that everybody that's being served is somehow the same and is going to be well addressed by the formulaic uh, uh, approach. And so the, uh, of course, the individuals that are least served by most of the systems that are out there are not served by that, by those formula or by something that can be scaled by um, replicating a single approach to a formulaic approach for a homogenous large group or the, uh, the more homogenous um, majority. So our planning process are different, our data gathering processes are different, how we determine what our impact is, um, is different. So in every case, we're looking at diversity and complexity and the current data systems, research systems, research methods, statistics, AI, etc., are quite hostile to both diversity and complexity. And that isn't good for anyone um, and um, can in fact, uh, we can trace back a lot of the, the um, risks and issues that are, are happening at the moment because of that preponderance to, to deal with people who are complex and diverse um, as though they are some homogenous mass. And I'm getting more into the theory there, but, but there, there are practical ways in which, and practical tools that we're using to sort of counter that, that trend as well. I want to leave Cheryl's essential question on the table as well. And also, um, you know, we're thinking about who is not included in the platform co-op ecosystem and who may be, whose voices may be uh, left heard in this work, but also open it up to other questions that people may have as we've been talking for the last uh, few minutes and, and give people an opportunity to ask questions and, and open it up. So if you have a question, please feel free to jump in. Hi, can you all hear me? Yes, we yes. can. Yeah, I've got some rough internet and it's pouring rain down here. I'm in Alabama. Uh, but uh, I just had a, a question. Uh, I've been able to communicate some with Trevor and Michael. Uh, and uh, my friend Tyler's on the call too, who does some programming work. And had a question um, about uh, if anyone has worked with hybrid co-ops uh, in terms of, you know, multiple forms of member owners. Um, and it's part of, uh, you know, I think that some of what I've heard you all talk about is <clears throat> trying to make sure that uh, the design is inclusive. I think um, in, in some of how it's coming to mind for me, it makes me think that there could be a place for sort of um, deliberate inclusivity, but limited to uh, the groups that you want to be, you know, uh, that, that would be owners. Um, and so, you know, we're looking at the possibility of a, a food delivery app in a small southern town. Uh, and some of the basic ideas that the work, the folks delivering the food would be worker owners and that perhaps some of the restaurant owners uh, could be have some partial ownership too. Um, maybe, uh, maybe even something beyond that. If it was to get into say community owners or something like that. But uh, I think I'm wondering if anyone's had any experience with with something like that a hybrid uh, co op and and some, you know, maybe strategies to start um, to start uh, getting people together to have those conversations. Uh, yeah. I mean, I have some community organizing background, so that's some of my sort of 
uh, there's ideas I have, but I'd be curious you all's perspective on that. So uh, Brendan, if I, I, if I can clarify which part of, I mean, we, could, we have lots to say about that. And with, I mean, you brought up some really interesting questions. One is um, the, who to include within the different designs that you have when there is a specific community or there's a specific group that you're trying to design this for. Um, but then you're, it's also um, the community engagement part of it. There's, there's probably some, I mean, embedded in designing some, such a hybrid system would be um, this, the software architecture or the way in which you create the system as well so that there's two, if we're talking about platforms, there would be two different sort of doorways or entry points, one for the shopkeepers, one for the delivery, um, the individuals that are delivering, etc. So mm -hmm. how to design the system in that way. I, I, um, and I'll, I'll leave the more practical questions regarding the software design to Colin. But the, the one reason why, even if you have a fairly confined group or a very specific group of individuals that you want to use the interface, the, the conditions under which they're working, their context, their needs are going to change as well. And so even within that group, it's, it's good to continuously figure out how you can be as inclusive as possible because um, uh, the, the, the particular scenarios that they're, you know, their form of transport, the way that they want to pick things up, the, their schedules, all of those things are likely to change. Um, or to, to adjust to the context and, and their particular personal situations. And so um, even within, even if you, you think you know almost exactly who it is for and what their current context is, it's good to in, try to be as inclusive as possible. Um, and um, a multi-sided system uh, requires you create something that is flexible that's going to move and and that's reflected in the software system that we have because there may um, also be the opportunity you, you're now identifying two stakeholders the um, individuals that want the delivery to happen um, the individuals that are delivering there may be another entry point for the customers that are receiving delivery etc so even there th that there may be an expansion of th there may be a third party funder, there may be a, a way to um, advertise and increase the, the delivery that's happening. There may be something for, I, I don't know, the, the, um, the, there may be many un, unanticipated uh, people that are participating in your, uh, your particular design. And so for all those reasons, it's great to um, not think too narrowly and not um, exclusively with respect to the design that you start. But I'll, I'll turn it over to Colin. Thanks. Thank you. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I was thinking, it's so great you brought up the, the point about change, that even, even an apparently, uh, you know, single group of people change over time. And software is, is funny these days, especially with using the kind of industry techniques and frameworks and tools that uh, there have been lots of studies that have shown that changing software is 80% of the cost of software that you, you, you know, you think you get it right. And then when you have to change it, that's where all the big costs come in. And, and so I'm interested um, both at the sort of theoretical and at the practical level of how we could make um, especially in the context of, of platform cooperatives, having the, the worker owners have some agency and autonomy to make their own changes. If, if they grow, if they realize that um, their working practices change, and this ties into governance, right? Maybe, maybe you make a, a change in the governance model of your cooperative, and then all of the workflows that the software has been coded to support might have to change. So are there things that we can do as, as technologists to create systems that are more, um, what I call material, more <coughs> changeable by people who aren't um, you know, expert level programmers to break some of that dependency um, between um, the, the technologists and the people who are living and working every day in the, in the platforms that are built. Um, I won't you know, get into details about specific techniques, but I think just in a general sense, 
um, thinking through as you know, you're developing technologies, is there a way to make this workflow not hard coded, but configurable? Is there a way to give um, the, the people using the system more ability to, to put their own um, needs and, and interests and, and change into the system over time? Are there other questions or comments of, of any sort? I know this. I I don't know this question of uh, how to reach people that we really haven't reached out to, right? Like in our design process, right? Like in these meetings that we have uh, pretty much every week or any other week, uh, we ask this a lot, right? Like so, we we that you this often came from you that when you said, uh, you know. Well, this sounds like you're designing, you want to design for the people we know, but we want to design for the people we don't know and should be part of this, right? But how this is a, it's very difficult. So I don't know what your thought processes are or how this question came up, like how to reach out to them, right? I mean, this is in part like a movement building question, right? I mean, uh, I think other questions that come in here are also questions of uh, translation, right? how you can deal with translation on such a sort of global scale and while also design conventions, right? Like when you think in this very international way. Yeah, I, li I like the question about translation because it gets to some of the, the practices and principles that we use because the, um, I, I, it relates to ownership and the sense that you want to communicate that the design is owned by more than you that that um, that people are willing to, or that people are are um, welcome to co-own it and co-own the process and um, you want to invite as much investment as possible so that um, I the the idea of cooperatives and inclusive design are actually so well aligned because we're always talking about within inclusive design, this um, co-creation, the collective production, collaboration, um, not having a particular uh, sort of single owner or someone that, that judges or, or determines whether something is complete or perfect or right, um, no winning design, <laughs> et cetera, which all is much friendlier to that collaboration to the collective production. Uh, which of course is in the spirit of cooperatism. So the, the 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 one thing that I think still needs to evolve and we still need to work on is how do you express that through something like a platform as co-ops and platforms are combining those two concepts, um, the, the software industry and certainly software interfaces, UX design um, are not that amenable as yet to that co-creation and to that collective production. So part of this experiment and this journey is to create as many um, models or uh, attempts or prototypes at uh, both the communication of the ideas, the software, the way that we design the software, the way we judge whether software is right or not right. I mean, all of those still need uh, quite a bit of development. and. It's an exciting space to be in because um, originally a lot of the technical tools that we're using were intended to be collaborative and um, uh, allow for co-creation, allow for that democratic participatory design piece, but they've uh, been uh, basically diverted into all of the things that are critiqued within the, the platform co-op system. Um, so it, this is taking our inclusive design combined with uh, the cooperative movement combined with the, the notions of platform co-ops is taking, uh, in a sense, this back to some of those early principles. As we approach the two o'clock hour, I just wanted to see also if there are other questions from people we haven't heard from yet. And if anyone has uh, any other questions for you there, Colin or Cheryl or Dana or Michelle. Uh, 
I just have something to add, Michael. If there are no questions, and I, um, in the spirit of co-design and always asking, you know, who's not at the table, um, us, our design team at the IDRC, um, we have created a little form for those who want to volunteer and co-design with us for anything we create in the future, including our websites, including the map we're going to create, like all of these things that, uh, even ideas, right? So we want to get your feedback, obviously. So I've created a little form and I'm going to paste the URL in this little message box here. Um, unfortunately, I couldn't get a better URL. It just has my name on it. But uh, if you would like to be involved in any of our design efforts in the future, just uh, put your name and email there and we'll reach out to you. And, you know, if you know anyone who totally should be involved in this process, um, who you think isn't at the table yet, please feel free to send it to them. And we look forward to um, being iterative about our, our inclusion process as well. And you're welcome That's to awesome. initially just lurk and then decide that you're comfortable in contributing as well. Any style of, <laughs> of participating. That's awesome. Thank you, Cheryl. And I, I might paste in one more link, um, not that we need too many links, but um, in terms of like, we, we've talked about lots of different ideas and, and processes and, and, and stuff, but um, I thought I'd paste in a set of resources around how to do your own co-design activities, events, um, engagements with people. Um, and we built this um, related to this city's project that I mentioned earlier. But if you're looking, you know, Trevor, you asked about um, ways to build the movement and, and to grow um, with those people who, who aren't here. Um, we've, we've compiled a bunch of techniques around how to build, build trust and make uh, relationships in your communities and, and, and stretch a little bit. So there's the link I've pasted in the chat to that. Yeah, and I just really wanted to emphasize something you just said about not being afraid to sort of blunder a little bit or offend a bit or not know, you know, you can't, can't know before you know. So that, I mean, for me, that's a big part of it too, and reaching out to communities that I'm not a part of um, in contexts that I'm not familiar with, I'm not going to know, <laughs> I'm probably going to make some mistakes. So I think that that's a really, um, to me, a really important point to make. Cool. Um, I'll leave maybe a few seconds for any final, final questions, if anyone has anything that's on their mind. Hey, this is Tyler. Um, is there a, a f an organization that's done software cooperatively that is maybe one of the panelists' favorite examples to review? Colin, do you want to? I was going to defer to you or Trevor. I mean, there's so many examples. And, and, and again, in, in, in a broader sense, I mean, I'm thinking about cooperatives uh, in terms of um, the movement of cooperatives, also open source uh, uh, communities and, and collectives that have built um, in different ways. Um, but I, I'm not sure I want to name one. There's so many that are, that are interesting. But if others have, have suggestions. What do you think, Yuta? What would you think? You yeah, I, I don't think there's anyone. And, and in the spirit of it's okay to make mistakes, um, we've certainly participated in quite a few, and we can point to what has worked and what hasn't with some. But um, amongst them, the, uh, the one that we've probably had the most experience with is uh, things like Sakai and UPortal and those which uh, provide a lot of great lesson of regarding what can go wrong, what can go right, and what, what seems to work. Um, the, the one thing that we often, um, or the, the one proviso we make when we're asked these sorts of questions is that um, while models and exemplars are good, they're not taking into account the particular community that you have or the context or the goal that you have. And so that uh, a large part of what we try to do is to uh, find from those exemplars or models or examples uh, the, the, the lessons or the principles that, that are transferable and how we need to adapt them to our particular context. So um, that it's not so much a, a weasel answer as um, a, a principle that, um, that it's really, really hard to uh, trans, 
translate something that has been built in one context for one community to a new context or a new community. I mean, it's, it's sort of in the same vein as, um, well, I won't get into a, a philosophical <laughs> debate about this, <laughs> but we, we try to say everybody is different, every context is different, every community is different. And then what can we learn from, uh, especially the, the things that have gone wrong, but also the things that have gone right in other contexts that are similar. Well, I was going to say too that I think the IDRC does a great job of putting um, information about the projects they're working on on their website. So if you do want to kind of dive into a particular project that the IDRC is working on, they are super transparent. And I think Colin put a link um, in the chat feature, which will take you to their website where you can kind of explore more. But um, as we are approaching the 2 p.m. hour, I did want to kind of wrap up here and thank you, Colin, Yuta, Dana, Cheryl, and Michelle from the IDRC for taking time to join us today. We, um, it was really awesome to hear your thoughts and thinking and the kind of history of, of where you guys are coming from and, and what's kind of essential to inclusive design and why it is so relevant for Platform Co-op. So many round of applause for you guys and thanks so much for taking time today. Um, I did want to mention April 2nd, we are having our next community hangout with two researchers, one from France, one from Germany, Damien Bunders and Claire Le Breton, who will be talking about their dissertations in particular. I think they're both working on ethnographies of platform co-ops, one in France, one in Germany, um, and are kind of at this cutting edge of PhD students researching platform co-ops and making findings and drawing out lessons. So that should be really exciting. I think that's at 1 p.m. on April 2nd, 1 p.m. Eastern time. Um, so make a note of that in your calendar, but um, I think that's a wrap for today. So thanks, thanks so much, everyone, for joining us. We really appreciate you taking the time. Yes, uh, one more thing, actually, right, Michael, that we wanted to add, uh, which is uh, on April 22nd uh, here in New York at the New School, we will launch a new research institute, and uh, Julie, who is here, will be there with us, and he will live stream the event. Uh, and uh, so this will be the launch of a research institute focused on the cooperative digital economy here at the New School. Great. Thank you so much, everyone. Thanks Thank so you. Much.